In today's episode, we're going to be looking at the San Antonio Spurs from a dynasty point of view. Michael Bolton. Let's get to it. To it. Let's get to it indeed. You are locked on fantasy basketball, your daily fantasy basketball podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at BasketballMonster.com and at Yahoo Sports Australia. And you can find me as always on Twitter at RedRock underscore B-Ball and on Instagram at Locked On Fantasy Basketball. Today's episode also brought to you by Built Bar, the best tasting protein bar that you can find. One other quick announcement, if you are either Australian or you are looking for live sports to watch, the Australian Football League is kicking off in a couple of days. And something that I've been trying to do for the last couple of years, Locked On is going international. And we are starting the Locked On AFL podcast. So Aussies, you don't want to deal with the nonsense media that we currently get covering this sport. Hopefully, I'm able to change that myself and Kane Pittman are going to be hosting the Locked On AFL show. Those of you in America or Canada or around the world who want some live sport to watch, the Australian Football League, it's back on June 11th. So if you want to get up to date with what's happening in the league, check out the Locked On AFL podcast wherever you find podcasts, Spotify, um, Apple Podcasts, wherever. Even if you don't, if you can download it, subscribe, it would really, really help get the show off the ground and help the expansion of the Locked On Podcast Network and help me be able to, to fulfill, I guess, a, a dream of being able to expand it into a whole uh, international area uh, where the network can cover. So that would be great if you could go and search Locked On AFL and subscribe, download, and maybe get yourself into a new sport as well. So what we are talking about on today's show is, of course, the San Antonio Spurs, looking at them from a dynasty point of view. Uh, if surprisingly for a team that you look at and go, oh, they're going to be in a bit of trouble moving forward. They've got a number of young prospects that are interesting to talk about. No real actual stud type guys, but a number of players that are absolutely worth talking about. And let's start with DeJounte Murray, who returned this season off an ACL injury. Um, I think he showed some good play at times. He struggled at others. But the frustrating part about Murray was the 25 minutes a game and the fact that we just didn't get to see him and Derek White really played together at all. The two guys who you'd consider, well, if they're going to have any sort of young talent hope happening you know, with this squad, um, these are going to be, it's going to be one of these guys that, that has to really uh, get it going. Uh, unfortunately, we just didn't see them play together at all. Murray coming back off that ACL injury started the season straight away. Moved, did move to the bench at times. Has been sort of back and forth, but the only 25 minutes a game was, um, was absolutely frustrating to be able to see that. Now, they only played 102 minutes together all season, so it is a really small sample size of those guys being together. So we didn't get to see a, a huge amount um, a huge amount with them on the court, which is just, you know, we, we needed to see more. Now, the results were, were bad. They were like a minus eight and net rating during that time, so that needed to be worked on, but we didn't get to see enough of it. As for Murray, in those 25 minutes, he was the 70th ranked player. He only averaged 11 points, so why was he able to be that good? Well, it's really all just coming down to steals. 1.7 steals. He averaged 6 rebounds, 4 assists, 0. 0.6 threes, 48 and 80% uh, from the line. So, you know, okay percentages, but it's realistically steals that put Murray at that level. Um, and, and that's where he sat for you know, most of the season. So a rosterable guy, but really only when you're looking at steals. Now, his advanced numbers, they weren't really as kind to him. He was well down the list of uh, San Antonio Spurs players in terms of P PIPM. You look at, yeah, there's plenty of guys who are hitting. I think he was actually, he was a negative. He was a negative 0.48 in PIPM. So there's about six or seven guys that actually came in ahead of him on this team. Uh, and one of those guys was not DeMar DeRozan, who uh, who did actually struggle in those advanced numbers. But Murray showed an ability. I'm not, I'm not convinced that he is a bona fide star. The offensive stuff is still pretty rough. He doesn't shoot threes. He shot 38%, but he doesn't shoot them. 1.6 attempts per game. So you can now, at some point, he might be like De'Aaron Fox, who didn't take any threes as a rookie. He might be like Brandon Ingram, who didn't take any threes for three years. And eventually, that good shooting number turns into way more volume. And if that happens, then he's a top 40, top 50 guy comfortably. He's never going to be a top uh, level assist player. He's never going to be a 20 point per game scorer, I don't think. But could he be 16 with uh, seven, seven rebounds? five and a half assists 
1.7 steals and hit 1.6 threes. That's really sort of upper level of where he gets to, but I don't think it's a complete impossibility. So while I do have considerable concerns about Murray, about being an upper level point guard, I think he can be strong enough. And I would like to have seen him and White play together and see exactly what they were able to develop for this squad. Unfortunately, Greg Popovich did not agree with me in that, uh, in that decision. So let's talk about Derek White, who was fantastic for this team last season, leading them for most of the year. Um, and... You know, just didn't really take a step forward. Now, that's not all on Pop. He wasn't quite as good as what he was the year before. White, only 24 minutes, 10 points. Like uh, Murray, he didn't take a lot of threes. Now, he took almost double the amount that DeJounte did, but hit only at 36%. He gets to the line a lot more than Murray. He hits his free throws a lot better. But one of the reasons why his numbers just don't look as good, and, and while they're yeah, down from where they were the year before, is the fact that the minutes weren't there, but also the steal numbers dropped, and um, yeah, they weren't fantastic. Now, he's a guy that can block shots, and we saw that. 0.9 blocks per game is excellent for a point guard shooting guard. But we need you know, 1.2, 1.3 steals. And you saw that over his last nine games, he played 26 minutes, Averaged 12 points with 1.2 steals and 1.3 blocks on 89% from the line and hit a three a game. So he had a big opportunity this season. He didn't take it, which was unfortunate for him. And that's some of that's his fault, some of it's not. I don't really know where we're going to go with him. Now, he's, I talk about yeah, PIPM. He was third on this team. Uh, yeah, really strong numbers. Offensively, yeah, above average. Defensively, really good. He was second on this team in wins added behind only Paddy Mills. Uh, and I think Mills' presence actually impacted what Murray and White could do as well, because he had to get his 21, 22 minutes a night because he's really, really good, but not obviously a, a part of the future in this squad. So Derek White is an interesting one. I think we look at him as maybe he can have a top 50 season moving forward. Um, I, I would expect yeah, another two or three top 100 type seasons, but the current situation for him with San Antonio, it just isn't good. The And a lot of this is DeMar DeRozan related as well, is it's hard to put both Murray and White on the court with DeRozan's out there. DeRozan has the ball in his hands a lot, and that takes assists away from White and Murray. So with both of these guys, a lot of it is to do with what the hell happens with DeRozan. And if DeRozan goes this offseason, then it is going to open up a lot more for White and Murray to, to step forward and to be able to have the ball in their hands and go from four assists to five and a half or six assists and to be able to play 28 minutes instead of 24 minutes. I think that thing, DeRozan, for as good of a player as he can be as a, a mid-range, one-on-one type scorer, he impacts everything else on your team in a negative way, and defensively he's rough. And that means whoever else has to play with him, it, it impacts what they do. And I think a large portion of what went wrong with Derek White this season was the, the issue of having DeRozan around and the sort of limitations that creates for other players on that roster. I think we, we saw that. I think it was fairly well il illustrated you know, when they play together, or just the sort of problems that DeRozan does cause for others out there. Now, uh, interestingly, DeJounte Murray was a negative 5.9 this season. White was a plus 3.6. So that is interesting in itself, but it's also because the you know, DeRozan, massive negative. Aldridge, negative. Bryn Forbes, negative. DeJounte Murray, negative. These are all negative on-off players, whereas the bench players are all pretty strong positives. Paddy Mills, huge plus. Jakob Pertl, big plus. Someone like uh, Marco Bellinelli, even a big plus. And that's the units that White was running with. So is it White lifting those guys up? Is it that bench unit just being a better fit than those starters? Which has been the case for a couple of years in San Antonio. So I wouldn't say it's just a sample size thing because last year the same thing. All the starters sucked and the bench units were really good. And that's yeah, two almost full years of data to say that that Aldridge DeRozan pairing actually doesn't create positive impact on court. If you swap this bench players and put them as starters, would it actually be the same going up against other starters? That's really hard to know. But there is a real impact there of playing alongside those guys. And I think that Murray, and White to an extent, did uh, did fall victim to that somewhat with that squad. I still do believe in Derek White you know, becoming uh, having a, some top 100 seasons in fantasy as we move forward. If you want to move forward with your weight loss goals or your bulking up goals, and you want to find the best tasting protein bars that you can possibly find, Built Bar, that is your answer. Built Bar are the best tasting protein bars that are around. Anyway, 16 awesome flavors. They are covered in 100% chocolate as well. Eight of those flavors are nut-free. They used to introduce some new ones as well. A pineapple upside-down cake was one of those flavors, and that uh, sounds absolutely fantastic. High protein, low calories, low sugar, a fantastic nutritional profile on these Built Bar protein bars. And... If you want to save 10 bucks off your first order on Built Bar, go to builtbar.com. Use the promo code LOCKEDON. Enter that when you check out and you save $10. 
off your first order. You can go get that uh, 18 bar, 15 flavor mixed taster box. Fantastic. Just find out the flavors you like, the ones you love, and, uh, and get yourself some really high quality, great tasting, high protein, low sugar, low calorie protein bars. BuiltBar.com, promo code locked on. So let us talk about here the, the next guy that we want to talk about on this list. Of course, that would be great to do. And that is Jakob Pertl, who again, because of the limitations of this squad, the limitations of Aldridge, the limitations of DeRozan, to be honest, the limitations of Murray. We just didn't see much of Pirtle. They had to put Trey Lyles as a starter next to Aldridge, as someone who would at least shoot, because that Pirtle, Aldridge, DeRozan, Murray combination is absolutely no shooting whatsoever in that group. Jakob Pirtle, unsurprisingly, led this team in PIPM. He has always been an advanced stats monster. He was a plus 5.7 in on-off as well. Led the team in uh, PIPM. Was third in wins added, despite playing under 1,000 minutes. In fantasy, he was the 200 ranked player, ranked player because he only played under 17 minutes. Five points and five rebounds, but 62% from the field, huge building block. 1.4 blocks in 17 minutes, massive. You take those 17 minutes and you put them to 27 minutes, what are you looking at here? A 11 and 10 bloke with two and a half blocks on decent volume, 62% shooting. Yeah, and this is on 49% from the line. So that's a punt free throw st stat. It's a pretty big number. And you push that, you know, take that out of the consideration, then you are talking about a top 100 guy. He is not even 25. He is going to be a restricted free agent. Um, he is going to start somewhere in the NBA, and he is going to be a top 100 center, a marching Gortat, maybe. That's the sort of player that I can you know, compare him to in terms of impact. Have three or four top 50 ish, top 70 ish type of seasons. That's what I see from Jakob Pertl. It just is hidden because of how the team has been constructed and where he's had to sit. He was disappointing at times this season, but I thought overall he played pretty well. He just didn't get the minutes that were necessary. Really good defender, excellent offensive rebounder, good rim protector, has some value offensively, can't shoot, and the free throws are a huge, huge problem. But overall, I thought Pirtle did well. Just in limited minutes, it may have been a little bit hidden uh, on this team. Let's talk about the next guy on my list, and that's Lonnie Walker, who Spurs fans have been calling out for this guy to play more minutes. They have a significantly higher opinion of Lonnie Walker than I do. I did not like him particularly heading into the draft. I didn't really love what he did last year in the season. He barely played. And this year he can't, comes on, and he plays okay. But the problem I have with him, especially from a fantasy point of view, is what does he do well? Right, what does he do? Can he score? Let's look at his per 36 numbers because he played only 14 minutes a night and he averaged five points. Like, it's rough. The usage of 18. But So what do you do? 14 points per 36, five rebounds per 36, 1.4 threes, two assists. These are all very low numbers. 1.3 steals, not bad, but not great per 36. 0.6 blocks, true shooting of 52%. He hit 41% of his threes, but again, super low volume. So what is he good at? Now, we can we had a small sample size of him in an elevated role. He started four games and played 26 minutes in those games. He averaged eight points. He had a true shooting of 45%. He gave us under two assists, under three and a half boards, half a three. Now, he did have 1.8 steals, and it was encouraging to see him get some steals this season and improve in that area. 28 steals across his 53 games. Well, that's, it. that's at least encouraging. But I do not look at Walker and go, he is a top 40 fantasy guy in waiting. The question you ask yourself when looking at these guys and you go, oh, he's, and if the answer is, why is this guy good? Oh, he's smooth. He gets buckets. That doesn't mean anything for fantasy. I don't care how good his hair looks. I don't care how smooth he is. I don't care if he gets buckets. If all you do is get buckets, you need to be so, so good at getting buckets that you're scoring 25 a game uh, and doing it on really high efficiency to be a use, useful fantasy player. Otherwise, you're just Jordan Clarkson, a worse version of Jordan Clarkson. Can you rebound, assist, high volume threes, get steals, get to the line, shoot good percentages? And so far, the evidence of that for Walker is no. He's still young, of course. He's only 21. So things can change. It is, of course, going to require the absence of Patty Mills, the absence of Marco Bellinella, the absence of DeMar DeRozan. So probably one or two years away from that happening. How does he fit next to someone like Murray and White? Because that's yeah, ideally, they'd like to pair them together. Does he play at the three next to both of them? But again, not a good three-point shooter. Like not, 
that's that's a bit not fair because he did shoot 41% on one attempt per game. We are talking extraordinarily low volume here for uh, for Walker for these threes. He was 29 out of 71. Like that is not a high, a large sample size at all, and came out of Miami as not a good three point shooter. So I have some significant worries about what happens with him. He's Defensive numbers were okay this year. PIPM, nothing overly spectacular for the season for Walker. But because he was a part of those bench units, he was a positive in on-off. Again, less than what Ballinelli was, who somehow had a pretty strong season despite not being a good player for a couple of years. So Walker's one of those guys, and I could absolutely be wrong on him. There is no doubt about that, and I could be very, very wrong. I just do not value him anywhere near as highly as Spurs fans or a lot of fantasy people out there, fantasy managers, fantasy analysts. I I just don't value it. He plays that position where it is harder to get those elite fantasy players, shooting guard. You've got Jimmy Harden. You get Brad Beal because they do these other things, a bunch of other things. Walker doesn't do that. He falls. That's why that shooting guard position drops off really quickly. And so many shooting guards are at the end of drafts because they just struggle. Look, is he turned into Contavious Caldwell-Pope? Is that a name that you want to get excited about from a fantasy point of view? No. Absolutely no. Does he Avery Bradley from a fantasy point of view? Like, uh? Is he a worse Dylan Brooks? Uh? Like, these are not good names. He's not Harden. He's not Beal. He's not even Zach Levine. Maybe he can become Zach Levine. But Zach Levine had to take a step to become a monster usage guy with a monster efficiency while still sucking at numerous other areas of the game. That is the real worry I have with Lonnie. So I think it's fair to say that I'm not all that high on him as we move forward. Blinkist is one of the most useful apps that you can find on your phone, on your tablet, on your laptop. It takes non-fiction books, gets all of the key takeaways, all of the key information out, and condenses it down into 15-minute segments, whether that's listening to it for 15 minutes or just reading for 15 minutes. A whole book in 15 minutes. You cannot ask for more. Successful people, they need to better themselves, and there's no better way than bettering yourself than getting Blinkist and getting that information into your head as quickly as possible. Get rid of the extraneous fluff. Blinkist gives you the key points that you need. You want to listen to a book like The 4-Hour Workweek by Tim Ferriss. Blinkist has got it for you. The Sports Gene, Inside the Science of Extraordinary Athletic Performance by David Epstein. Blinkist has got it for you. And with Blinkist, you get unlimited access to read or listen to a massive library of condensed non-fiction books, all the books you want, and all for one low price. And right now, for a limited time, Blinkist has a special offer just for our audience. Go to Blinkist.com slash NBA. Try it free for seven days and save 25% off your new subscription. That's Blinkist, spelled B-L-I, try again, B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T dot com slash NBA to start your free seven-day trial. And you'll also save 25% off, but only when you sign up at Blinkist.com slash NBA. All right, after Lonnie Walker, we get into the blokes who we just didn't see really any of at all. And that, we'll start with their first round pick this season, and that is Keldon Johnson. Um, Johnson, one of their first round picks. He played nine games. He played 10 minutes. He played 90 minutes in the NBA in total. It's really not enough to judge uh, what he was able to do uh, this season. A, A guy that put up some pretty horrendous college numbers. A uh, 3 and D player who had no defensive stats and some poor shooting numbers. And unfortunately, in the G League, he was pretty similar. Now, to be fair to Calden, he averaged 20 points in 30 minutes in the G League. So he really did up his usage and was able to score well. But 24% from three on only three attempts per game is woeful. One steal, 0.5 blocks, two assists and six rebounds. Like, he's looking like just very much... Uh, like a wing player who gets out there because he looks like a wing, but is he ever going to be a successful NBA player? I have yeah, pretty significant doubts uh, about him being at least an impactful guy. Now, he is a rookie, so it's obviously hard to make that big judgment on Calden, but it's again that thing that when my concerns about him coming out of college then replicate in the G League, it doesn't really give me hope that I'm going to be wrong in that instance or think, oh, shit, maybe I was wrong and I misjudged him. He was okay in the G League, and but he really you've thrived by just having a 27% usage. And your true shooting was 63%, which is massive because he was able to finish at the rim really strongly, 61% shooting overall. Like that's, They're really strong numbers. But can you do that in the NBA? At 6'5", I'm not sure. Is he good enough defensively? I'm not sure. I don't have massive faith in what Keldon Johnson's going to do when we see him in an NBA rotation, which I think will probably be next season because he did play his way into at least having some decent form this year. But uh, yeah, I think we're a little bit away from that being something we get too excited about. 
Let's talk about the next, about the next bloke, and that is Chemezi Metu, a, a second-round pick from a couple of years ago who has played almost predominantly in the G League. Well, he played 16 games this year in the NBA. Didn't really get to see too much out of that. Only four and a half minutes per game. So again, really, really limited sample size. 73 minutes in total. But if we do have a look what Metu did in the G League this season, he played 29 minutes and had 18 and 9. So they are, yeah, they are, they are pretty good numbers. They're definitely not something that completely blows you away when, in terms of looking at his G League performances. But 1.3 steals, 1.6 blocks, 38% from three. And most importantly, he went from shooting 0.7 triples last year to 2.3, so tripled his three-point rate and got up to 38%. The free throws, still a little bit of a work in progress, but I think there's a little bit there. He was a guy that I didn't mind coming out of college. He had some good fantasy translations, and getting that three-point percentage up while simultaneously improving your efficiency, providing good defensive numbers and improving your uh, advanced numbers as well defensively, it gives me a little bit of hope. Now, can he turn into a guy that shoots from three like Trey Lyles did? Will he be a part of a front court of the future with Pirtle, Lyles, Metu? Could that work? I'm not ruling it out. I think that Metu can be, at the very minimum, a rotation player. And if he works, and if he, you know, even if it doesn't come next year, but if he works again on going from 2.7 triples a game to you know, five and hits them at 38%, then you're really cooking. A guy that can rebound, a guy that can defend, a guy that can hit threes and be an offensive threat. There's really something there. And the trend for him at the moment, uh, I think encouraging is probably the way to look at it. So that was that was really good to see from uh, from Metu this season, is having that ability to, to improve his three-point volume and three-point shooting. I wouldn't bank on it, but that was an, an impressive thing nonetheless. Let's go on now to the next guy on this list, and that is... Uh, Quindary Weatherspoon, a two-way guy who was undrafted, played uh, 29 minutes a game for Austin, 15 points, five assists from the wing, which is an interesting number. Six foot four shooting guard, small four type player, 15 points, four rebounds, five assists. He shot 81 from the line and 34 from three, a decent enough volume, but not massive. I thought he was okay enough. He looks like one of those blokes that you'd see get called up to a non-playoff team, play you know, 20 minutes a night on a 10-day and look all right and then sort of disappear. I wouldn't be shocked if he was able to latch on to a permanent rotation role somewhere. I'm also not putting massive amounts of faith in it at this point. But he was far from a disaster in the G League. I thought he at least fits at that level. And I think that we can you know, see him, if he does get into the NBA, maybe uh, maybe work in some sort of you know, 13th man type role. He only played 15 minutes in total in the, uh, in the NBA this season. This bloke, amazingly, who was the 19th pick in the draft, played fewer minutes. One game for Luka Samanich. 19 minutes. Sorry, not, that's not even true. 12 minutes he played. One game. He didn't score. He had three assists. I, you, I cannot take anything out of those 12 minutes. The Spurs weren't going anywhere. They, maybe they make the playoffs in this new format. I don't know. They weren't going anywhere, let's be honest. So what did he do in uh, Austin? 15 points in 29 minutes. Eight rebounds. The rebounds were okay. Defensive numbers, a little rough. Uh, 31% from three, a little rough. 77 from the line is an encouraging-ish number. And I'll tell you what, Jacob Goldstein's um, career projection stuff for Samanich comes out really good. And if you haven't seen, Jacob has his uh, stuff, his, all his POPM stuff on his new website, which is winsadded.com. So go and check winsadded.com. But his numbers and his PIPM projects out really, really strong summonage. Now, I'm not sure I buy it completely. Um, I don't, again, I don't really know what he's going to be good at. I think he can be a solid enough uh, rebounder. I think he can be a solid enough scorer. But will he be a guy that can create for himself or for others? I don't think so. Can he turn into a really good shooter? We're a little bit away from that from Samanich. And it really was, yeah, I think, a lost season in terms of what we saw from him. Because literally one game. Like, that's bullshit. He needed to play more than that. But one game is all we saw from Luka Samanich. The last guy I'm going to talk about is a guy that's not even in the NBA and is a player who I believe maybe him or Vasily Micic is the best drafted player who has not come over to the NBA yet, and that is Nikola Malutinov, 
who played for Olympiakos this season in EuroLeague. I don't think he even played any in the Greek League, just in the EuroLeague. But he has recently signed with Cheska Moscow for next season. He could come over with a buyout, depending on what they do with guys like Aldridge and uh, and Lyles. Uh, you know, they've got Pirtle there, but they could lose Pirtle as well in restricted free agency. I think he could. I think he can play an NBA role already. I, I think he's uh, he's good enough to do that. He is seven foot tall. He's twenty five years of age. He is not a stand. He's not a European big bomber. He's a big ass body who can protect the rim. He averaged in the Euro League this season ten points with eight boards. 0.6 blocks is not a great number, but he can do an okay job of protecting the rim. Good free throw shooter. There is, I think, some ability for him to stretch out somewhat. But what he is is a stout defender who puts up pretty good numbers uh, in terms of being a defensive player, an offensive rebounder, a guy that can go out there and um, and hit uh, or set screens, uh, be an offensive rebounder. Very similar to what Jakob Pertl does, but I think someone that's got a little bit more touch on his shot. So if you're in deeper dynasty leagues and looking for players who aren't even in the NBA, Milutinov and Micic, I think Micic is probably a little bit higher, but Milutinov and Micic uh, are two guys to really look at. Some really strong PIPM numbers from uh, uh, Milutinov over there in the, uh, or Milutinov, I'm not sure how to pronounce that one, uh, over in the EuroLeague. A plus 3.11 is a really strong number in EuroLeague there. So absolutely, he is a name to watch. And much like guys like Nicole Ormelli, Daniel Tice, when they came over, when he comes over, he's going to be a rotation player and he's going to be an impact guy and you're going to need to know him. So he is a guy that I would have above Samanich, Metu, Keldon Johnson, Quindary Weatherspoon. Uh, probably not Pirtle, but not too far away there. And shit, if he came out, I wouldn't be surprised if he has a higher peak than even someone like Lonnie Walker. And I could be very much wrong on that. But that's a, he's absolutely a guy to pay some attention to. That'll do it, guys. That wraps up this entire series of uh, Dynasty, Dynasty shows, looking at all 30 teams. The NBA is still you know, seven or eight weeks away. So if you've got any ideas of types of shows that you want me to do, drop them down in the comments of this video below or tweet them at me at redrock underscore beeble. And we'll see what other things we can get going. Don't forget, subscribe, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and on YouTube. Guys, we are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya. <laughs>